welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we're here in the Old Capitol Senate Chamber on the campus of the University of Iowa to talk about cultural memory and commemoration. I'm glad you can join us. This theme, cultural memory and commemoration, will take us down some compelling pathways over the next four World Canvas programs, all very interesting stuff. We're going to delve into the intersection of music, theater, and cultural memory in part two. In part three, we'll hear from a leading scholar on how the Third Reich and the Holocaust are remembered in nations and populations that were most intimately involved in or affected by World War II, fascism, and Nazi atrocities. And in the last segment of this four-part series, we'll take a look at the other side of official memorial narratives when we consider alternative histories and what's called counter-memorials. But we begin the series tonight by asking what and why do we remember? It's my pleasure to introduce our guests tonight. Just next to me is Jeff Porter. Jeff is an associate professor in the University of Iowa Department of English. He's a documentary filmmaker, an essayist, and the author of the memoir, Oppenheimer is Watching Me. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next to him is Clifton Spargo, the provost postgraduate visiting writer in fiction at the University of Iowa for this academic year, and the author most recently of the novel Beautiful Fools, The Last Affair of Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald, published in 2013. Thank you so much for being here, Clifton. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, um, memory, such an intriguing thing. Each person carries individual memories that uh, some, you know, we may keep to ourselves and really never share with anyone else. And then there are those memories that we hold and we talk about and we share with our families, passed down generation to generation. Those memories and the narratives that develop from them become the histories of a time and a place and a people. Um, as a novelist, Clifton, as an author and a filmmaker, Jeff, how do you guys wrap your heads around something as sort of uh, elemental and yet sort of slippery as cultural memory? How does it affect the work you do? Start, Jeff. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, you know, there's so much forgetting that that uh, um, precedes any any kind of remembrance, and the actual memories, the raw memories that seem to make that possible, um, play a very small role. It's a bit of a surprise, especially if you're you're serious about remembering something. When I was uh, writing my book, I was trying to remember the Cold War, and partly because my parents forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> it was their world, and they kind of forgot it. And um, I interrogated them uh, uh, um, viciously, and I just, I just, I got blank stares, and it was really kind of mind-boggling. So I think, you know, the uh, uh, for me, the, the remembering something requires some kind of motivation, and, and, and partly it was sort of panic. I mean, this is something, the more they, the more they expressed the forgetfulness, the more uh, um, intrigued I was by what they forgot. And um, I had memories from the Cold War as a little kid, and they were, uh, but they were fragmentary. I couldn't build anything with these little memories. I remembered the air raid sirens, which were awful, and I never, I never really lost the fear and loathing once those air raid sirens came on. I knew that it was just a trial, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, but I would lock my transistor radio to our rock and roll station. It was under my bed, and the air raid sirens go off, and really it did sound like the end of the world, and I would uh, <coughs> fall out of bed, reach for my transistor radio, hit WKBW, and if, as long as the kinks were on, it was okay. <laughs> you know. But if, if I heard the static and some trace of Conrad, that was it. I mean, I would, have, I would have died on the spot, but that's what I was sort of waiting for. I have that memory. I remember also when my dad, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, started carrying jugs of water down in the basement. And my dad was kind of like, not really alert to the political moment. And so he was a musician, and, and that he was paying attention to something that made him do this. Was, uh, was a powerful image in my mind. I'm a little kid, I remember that too, but that's certainly not enough to work with. It was the forgetfulness of my parents, and so then uh, um, I, I wanted to fill in the gaps. And so mem re remembering for me is, is, is sort of uh, being provoked by, by forgetfulness and then finding ways to fill in the gaps. Yeah, yeah, is it something like that for you as well, Clifton? Yeah, well, I like what Jeff said, first of all, as long as the kinks are on, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. And, uh, <laughs> if we take one thing away from this show, I love the kinks. But I also like that Jeff began, began with forgetting 
because the relationship between memory and forgetting that is always to the form front, I think, with any creative act. You have to worry about that. And in going for this particular story about Zelda and Scott in Beautiful Fools, I'm going to the one episode that really we know almost nothing about. And it's a very weird thing that that came about. I was talking with uh, Fitzgerald scholar James West, who actually is the editor for the Cambridge edition to uh, Fitzgerald's works, and he says, yeah, you picked the right story. It's amazing that in lives so well documented, uh, lives well documented by Scott and Zelda themselves. Scott kept a meticulous ledger of his entire career. Their correspondence is ample. Um, we know so many details ab about their lives. And yet, I would get to the end of all these biographies and I would start flipping back wondering when was the last time they saw each other. And it turns out it's this trip they took to Cuba in April of 1939. None of the biographers actually established the dates, but I was able to find the notice of their arrival and their departure in the Havana Post. Uh, so, so that documentation I was able to establish that was an eight-day trip. And to me, that moment spoke to me as a fiction writer. It, first of all, there is the historical curiosity about Scott and Zelda, but there's also just the scenario. It's the last chance scenario of a couple, of any of us imagining someone in our lives, whether it's you know, a, a romantic love affair or just parents, siblings, or people who are most valuable to us, and you don't know it's the last time you're ever gonna see them. And so that scenario grabbed my imagination. And then the idea that was Zelda and Scott off the historical grid, so to speak, uh, I could allow, I could invent them and I could allow the possibility that they might reinvent themselves. So I like to call it the hole in history and that's kind of where the imagination entered, uh, is in that hole in history. And there are lots of ways in which I think forgetting is, is, is key to the composition process. One of the things with writers who are so well documented and their lives come through in all these biographies is you have to remember how much of the ordinary life goes missing. So when I get to know Zelda and Scott and all the facts of their lives through biographies, then I have to know them so well that I begin to forget their lives the way they do. Yeah. So there's all kind, there, are all, there are all kinds of moments um, in the novel where they're misremembering and yeah. Scott gets dates of where he was during the crash, confused with where he mm -hmm. was when Zelda was starting to break down. Mm -hmm. Because that's how the real, that's how minds truly work. Yeah. Uh, memory is attached to that process of forgetting. Yeah, and so the, 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 the writing itself, which has become you know, the real means of trying to remember, but it's, an, it's, it's kind of a new memory, it's a constructed memory, and that's really the most we can do. I think with that Chinese proverb, that I don't know very many Chinese proverbs, but I, I do know this one, and I think it's the uh, um, ink is the strongest, is a stronger memory than is the memory, than a strong memory. The, the, the writing is somehow essential to making memories somehow last. And I think that's sort of the work of cultural memory, is to, uh, is to somehow string together the stories as containers. For, mer for memories that are reconstructed. And I think the recovery, of, um, the recovery of personalities that do have a kind of uh, um, prominent role in, in any historical moment is uh, an interesting way of pursuing that. I was recovering Oppenheimer, who, whom to me was, uh, um, had been forgotten. Um, when I was doing my work, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist. Um, he was forgotten in his own lifetime by an active, uh, um, what would you call it, uh, an act of oppression, political oppression by the government, since he no longer fit within their scheme to build a hydrogen bomb. In fact, he suddenly became, had second thoughts about the whole, uh, whoops, <laughs> whole atomic program. And so um, the government did its best to repress him and repress his memories and was very, very successful. And so, by my adult moment, he had pretty much just become an entry in Wikipedia, and that was, that was hmm. pretty much it. So recovering Oppenheimer and doing the same thing is just um, somehow replaying all the facts of his life that had been somehow left out. 
um, in new ways um, made a big difference. And the crucial act for me in recovering Oppenheimer was sort of a, an act of empathy, and that was to, sort of, to play a kind of ventriloquism with Oppenheimer, and that is to actually get into his head and recreate his voice. So that he's not just simply an object of historical writing, he actually sort of is remade. In, in, in my text, and he kind of comes to life, as does Gary Powers and many other kind of uh, personalities from the, from the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And so the ventriloquism to me was something new, and, and, and that had the, most, uh, um, had the most effect on my imagination in, in the effort to somehow reconstruct a memory that might stay alive within this narrative. Mm -hmm. Well, and you were also a ventriloquist, no? Um, for both Scott and Zelda. I have, to, I have to play both both parts. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite moments in the novel, just in the reception of the novel, my agent first read the manuscript. She was very worried when we get to page 45. Um, there's a letter from Zelda, and she said, well, what are we, we going to have to ask permission from Princeton? This could take a while. How much are we going to have to pay? I said, I made it up. Uh, um, but it seemed to me that as a writer, of course you go and you make the letter up. Uh, the, the, there's tons of correspondence that survives, but in each of our lives, there's so much of the everyday that goes mm -hmm. missing. Mm -hmm. And we know there are letters yeah. that went missing from Scott and Zelda, and it seemed to me a more intriguing possibility uh, to, to capture her voice, and not to imitate it exactly. By that point in her life, um, her free associative capacity was wild, and so as wild as my letter may be, uh, her letters were even wilder. But to capture some of the rhythm and, and some of the truth of, of that life. And the other thing I wanted to say that seems uh, similar to what Jeff is saying about the uh, Oppenheimer's almost disappearing from history is Scott and Zelda seem so permanent to us now, but it's worth remembering that it wasn't necessarily that it had to be so, uh, that it wasn't necessarily so. In fact, I write about them, and uh, you know, I'm not sure what it says about me that I'm fascinated by the Scott and Zelda of the 30s, that they live this kind of allegorical life for the century. Zelda is the age of the century, uh, and they embody, and they become the personalities and the uh, poster children for the jazz age. And after the crash in October of 1929, five months later, Zelda begins her breakdown. And Scott and Zelda live a pretty catastrophic 1930s, uh, each of them. Um, Scott once said, I lost my capacity for hope on the little road that led to Zelda's asylum. And that becomes really the drama, the two of them fighting personal demons and a lot of loss. We think of that extravagant, glamorous couple of the 20s. We don't think about them as much in the, in the 30s. And Scott's reputation by that time, by the late 30s, was significantly on the, the decline. And we think of The Great Gatsby as a permanent mm -hmm. book, but it sold under 23,000 copies in its lifetime. Oh, oh what a shame. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I know, but if, if, for a book that sells, how many, yeah, we, we should, we'd all be happy to sell. Uh, but, um, but for a book that sells, whatever it sells now. Uh, and it's, he wasn't remembered as the writer of The Gatsby when he died. He was remembered yes. as the writer of This Side of Paradise, which is his spectacular oh. debut, yeah. and as a short story writer for the Saturday Evening Post. And he was really on the wane in terms of critical reputation. In fact, there's one story which I kind of replay in my novel of somebody meeting him while he's writing for the movies in Hollywood and stopping and saying, Scott Fitzgerald, I thought you were dead. Uh, yeah. And yeah. that really was the point at which it, it, he had arrived. His reputation was very much in jeopardy, and he was somewhat anonymous after so much fame. And I think that's also an important part of the story here is I was interested in the Scott and Zelda who get just outside uh, the arena of celebrity and become human in, in right. that border area, mm -hmm. as I said before, when they're off the grid. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, 
you guys have sort of a, I don't know, kind of a heavy responsibility in a way here because you have, in fact, used uh, uh, real people in some sense in memoir or in a, in a novelization. And, you know, some hundred years from now when this memory that we think we have of the 20s and the 30s and people like um, Scott and Zelda or of the 50s and Oppenheimer, that will be so remote to, a, to a, a people a century from now. They will perhaps look at the books you've written, and what you have added to this whole picture is part of a cultural memory that will be available to them, right? It's, it's frightening to think that um, historians 75 years from now will actually be setting these texts as primary resources <laughs> and, and imagining that these are actually kind of the, the thoughts and, and the words of these men, and they are being offered to the world as kind of you know the factual basis for sort of a new truth. But I think you know the. The scary implication of that is that memory, especially in the collective sense, is continually being rewritten. Mm -hmm. The narratives are, are constantly being retold. And I think it's naive, and even though it's irresistible, sometimes even necessary to imagine that memory is a kind of stable, permanent, and uh, verifiable kind of thing. Um, it's really not. You know, The neurologists are quick to tell us about how unreliable memory is. And you don't have to be middle-aged to suffer from unreliable memories. I think it sort of happens. It seems to be structured in the very way that uh, memories are, are stored by an associative imagination that is more wild than Borges mm -hmm. in its ability to kind of connect things that maybe don't belong together. Mm -hmm. right. And of course, there's then the question of the personal, the, the paradigm of personal memory and then the difference with social memory with Scott and Zelda, I often say about historical fiction that you have to remember that it's not necessarily the what. You have to begin with the why and the what will follow. So why do you want to tell this story now? Mm -hmm. um, and I've been asked like, why I happen to, my book happened to be published alongside a film of The Great Gatsby, yeah. uh, and no, Baz Luhrmann and I are not friends. Uh, mm -hmm. And I had no idea the movie was coming out when I was writing this book. Yes, my publisher then timed it to, be, yes. to, to arrive closely with the movie. But I like to think that there's something, that if, you, if you look for a trend, scratch a trend, and you'll find a tradition. So with, with the kind of book that I'm writing, there are antecedents that are not about Scott and Zelda. Mm -hmm. But if we're thinking about why their story right now has a certain kind of appeal, I do think, for me, looking at these two personalities in the decade of the Great Depression, at a moment in time when we've now suffered the greatest economic recession since the Great Depression, and we're thinking about that in relation to periods of extravagance before that, that there's a way in which many of our contemporary concerns start to be uh, put on the, the past. And I think that's always happening in what we remember at a particular moment in time as a culture and what we give emphasis to ha reflects uh, contemporary interests. I'll just give one quick anecdote, too, because movies are a very interesting gauge of this. There's a very rare 49 uh, Gatsby that you can go back and see, and it's heavily under the influence of the, of the Hayes Code. So <laughs> the end of the movie, it's a great, it, it's, a, it's a lousy reading. No of, it's a lousy reading of Gatsby, <laughs> but it's a wonderful reading of late 1940s um, because Daisy ends up pleading, you know, the, the book ends with the notes of carelessness about these two careless people. She ends up pleading with Tom, we have to call uh, Gatsby and tell him that it's a case of mistaken identity and Wilson's on his way and the f they actually, Tom's like, no, no, we can't do this, we can't do this. And then he finally agrees, okay, you wore me down. And so he picks up the phone and the phone is ringing at Gatsby's mansion while Wilson is walking up to shoot him and then they, they do the double horrendous but beautiful, marvelously crazy, uh, make the, uh, the <laughs> choice to have Gatsby speaking to Nick in the pool right before he's shot. And he repents. And he says, I've been thinking, Nick, I've led my life in a wrong way. I think I'm going to turn myself in for my past crimes and go straight. And it's right then that Wilson comes <laughs> in and shoots him. So it's this wonderful, ridiculous moralizing of Fitzgerald's yeah. story. But it reflects the moment in time yeah. and what the concerns of the culture were at that moment. And so you know, as, as a fiction writer, you're not deliberately setting out to do that, but you're probably unconsciously tapping yeah. some of that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's just spend a couple of minutes too, talking about the importance of place and built spaces or natural spaces in, in cultural memory. We've talked a little bit about Cuba of that period and your, your, your descriptions of Cuba and the right. beach and having never been there, I, you know, I haven't seen it myself, but I see it through your eyes in this novel. And I feel like I know what I'm looking at. I feel like I know the environment they're in. And you did a, a film some years ago, documentary on um, uh, traditional dance related to a saint's Oh, yeah, procession, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Men Who Dance the Giglio. And tell me just right, a little right, bit right. about that. Memory and Place. This was a, a Saints Festival in Brooklyn, New York, um, called the St. Paulinus Festival. It's not the most famous in uh, New York. I think it's the uh, St. Gennaro uh, Festival. At any rate, it's, uh, um, it's, in, it's in the borough of uh, Williamsburg, which used to be um, exclusively Italian-American. And uh, um, over the years, of course, it's, there's been a lot of change in cultural diversity. And so now there's lots of Russians, there's lots of Hasidic Jews, um, there's lots of Puerto Ricans, and there's fewer and fewer Italians. But this is a site of their two-week festival. And what they do, it's, it's, they brought it over during the uh, early 20th century um, immigration from the Naples area. They brought the festival. It's a medieval. It goes all the way back to the seventh century. And it uh, tells the story of, uh, of a saint who um, frees his people from um, Turkish capture. They, on their arrival to the Italian shores, people greet them with lilies, and so the festival is called the Giglio, and it's based on this big, big six-story tower that weighs about four tons, um, and this, that includes a platform with a 12-piece band. 128 guys, Italian-Americans, lift this thing all, all day long in, in the heat of the sun. And they dance it. The whole idea is to sort of dance it. And they reenact the story of St. Paulinus freeing his people and returning to Italy. So at any rate, it's, uh, it's clearly the festival has nothing to do with that old story. They're not interested in that story, obviously. They're not even interested in the story that seemed to be current in Nola, the hometown for this uh, um, saints festival. Uh, and there it's all about the guilds who construct these beautiful, there's eight towers. There's only one in Brooklyn. At any rate, the story seems to be about marking space. And so they're trying to, uh, it's almost as if this is a giant pen or a magic marker and they're marking the space as Italian. Yeah. You know, and, and I think the, it's, there's more desperation every year with the sense of loss of Italianicity in the area. People are in Florida now that used to live in that town. Um, but it's fascinating is that this event really was a way of retelling a story, a story about the ethnicity of this little town and the way it's been contested by, um, by the sort of vast cultural change in America. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like to add? Uh well, in bringing up place, you go right to the crisis of my composition, because the one impasse I reached at a certain point was Cuba, and what was I going to do about it? And I did actually go to Cuba in the summer of 2010. There are ways to go legally. I went on a humanitarian visa, so, so Jay-Z, Beyonce, and myself, we all went legally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I really did come to an impasse where I was wondering if I could put Cuba together with a pastiche of what I knew about Spain and other parts of Central America, and I really felt like I needed to get there. And we don't know what they did, so I made up a fake itinerary for myself <laughs> that becomes largely the itinerary of their trip, mm -hmm. and I put them in the Hotel Ambus Mundus, which is the famous hotel that Hemingway wrote For Whom the Bell Tolls From, and I just thought that Scott would be unable to resist going there on some level with uh, their friendship and its brokenness at that stage of his life. And so then I just give, and I went and stayed in the Hotel Ambus Mundus, and so I'm able to feel it's not 1939, obviously, although the old city of Cuba is the closest thing you can find to a time capsule. Um, so you can walk the streets, and I'll bet you most of those bricks are the same, and uh, <laughs> tourist guides were complaining about them back then. They still yeah. have all kinds of pipes and things that are uh, uh, obtruding into, in, into the walkways. But you can go and, you, uh, and, go and visit the La Floridita, the, the, the place uh -huh. where the daiquiri uh, was, was invented. And so I went to all those places, and that was the breakthrough for me. I was about halfway through the book, and I felt that Cuba had to become a little bit more real. And I was doing all kinds of research about Cuba, mm -hmm. but just being able to feel it spatially yeah. was an important imaginative breakthrough. Yeah. 
Oh, I wish we didn't have to end this segment. This is such fun. Thank you so much, Jeff Porter and Clifton Spargo. It's been just wonderful to talk with both of you. And I want to remind everybody who's listening or watching this program the names of the books we've been talking about here. Jeff's book is Oppenheimer is Watching Me. And uh, the book that Clifton Spargo has been speaking about is Beautiful Fools, The Last Affair of Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald. And by the way, there's a website where you can find out more about that. And it's beautifulfoolsthenovel.com. Uh, please join us next week when we'll continue our conversation on cultural memory and commemoration by looking at cultural memory as reflected in theater and music. World Canvas programming is available on UITV, on YouTube, iTunes, and the International Programs website. And uh, I'm Joan Kerr for International Programs. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.